to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that they passed the climate bill, because otherwise we could... Well, I shouldn't say because it's possible that <laughs> no, they won't. Don't. But I'm just going to assume. <laughs> yeah. Hank, this is dangerous. Assuming bill. is dangerous. It is very, it is very dangerous. We're going to have to record a different intro <laughs> if, if they don't. If something goes oh. horribly wrong. Um, but I have to ask you both: What's your favorite part of the climate bill? Hank, I am read any of that. <laughs> yeah, this is a horrible question to embarrass it's us. It's only 700 pages long. <laughs> Will you tell us some stuff about it? Because I just see and I see some people who are like one person who's on this podcast who's like this is monumental and then other people are saying like this is such bullshit where's the truth where's the truth sam i had a frustrating experience this morning when i listened to new york times the daily it's a podcast like our podcast but not as popular (laughs) and they it was it was all about this bill that the whole thing was like this is the big thing and they talked for what they talked about what was in the bill for less than two minutes. Yeah. And then they talked about Joe Manchin's pipeline for more than two minutes. Yeah. I was so frustrated. Like, I get it. It's, it's, uh, it sucks that uh, a person had to make this all about them, but it's not all about them. It shouldn't be all about them because there are hundreds, thousands of people who worked on the individual provisions in this bill. I've been going through it to try and make a video about it. There's like, a hundred different bills in the bill. Oh. There are some pieces that take up a pretty sizable chunk, but there is a very large chunk of this bill that is like little stuff, but like important little stuff. Things like revitalizing uh, urban neighborhoods to make them more walkable, like little stuff like that. Oh. Uh, cleaning up ports, which is, you know, tends to be a place that is mostly people who have less live around ports and they uh, thus. Those ports are able to get away with all kinds of doing, like polluting things that shorten the lifespans and quality of life of, of the people who live around there. And so there's there's stuff like that. Uh, and there's, but my favorite part, if you want to know my favorite part, it's the it's the methane regulations because almost all of this bill is spending money, but the methane regulations are making money because they say, hey. You built your natural gas infrastructure with a bunch of leaks in it, and you're going to have to fix that, or we're going to charge you for all the leaks that you're doing. Hmm. And that will incentivize those people to actually fix the infrastructure. So it, that, like this conversion that we did to a lower carbon source of energy, which is natural gas, which we're going to have to attend, like that's a bridge, uh, was, you know, is better for carbon, but every bit of that methane that escapes is a really big deal because it is more greenhouse intensive than carbon dioxide. Now, it doesn't last in the atmosphere as long, but for the time that it's there, it's more intensive. So we need to make sure that we don't get it out there, can't leave it in there. And I I was, that's like something that nobody's talking about. There's also nuclear power uh, money in there. There's all kinds of <laughs> funding for research for energy storage and solar panels and uh, um, it's just a big bill with a lot of stuff in it. It's a lot easier to talk about like the one thing that went wrong than the 85,000 things that went right because there's 85,000 of them. The news is so hard now. It's hard. It's, it's hard. It's going to be a fun takes. video though. I don't yeah. know what to believe anymore. So I think my proposal is you just read me the articles and tell me what you think. And then I'll know. Great. An ASMR live stream of all five or 700 <laughs> pages of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it'll be like my Mr. Beast moment. <laughs> well, <it's... laughs> yes, you could live that's... stream the whole thing. I wonder how long it would take me to read the 700 page well, you, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. You'll have something to say about every single freaking sentence. I won't shut up it's about it. That's the problem. <laughs> two years. <laughs> I really like this part. <laughs> Look at this. You need to do an ASMR reading of the whole thing and then an audio commentary track of <laughs> the reading of it. <laughs> no. Oh, he oh, wouldn't God. be able to stop himself, Sarah. You know that. While yeah, he's you doing really the can't ASMR suggest thing. these things. Because um, I, I could probably I could probably just go ahead and do that. Anyway, that's not the topic of the podcast. <laughs> Every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Sam. I have a question. I'll keep it brief. Tell me, please, what is a coral reef? It goes moo and is full of beef? No, that's a cow.
Not coral reef. <laughs> <laughs> a giant thing with trunk and leaf? No, that's a tree. Not coral reef. <laughs> it's conducted by Beethoven and has a light motif? No, that's classical music, not coral reef. It's got dusty tumbleweeds and an old sheriff. No, that's an old wild west town. Sheriff. Not a coral reef. Oh, for heaven's sake, and also good grief. It's clear to me that you don't know what's a reef. So stay tuned to this podcast, Chief, because Hank's about to ask, Sari, what's a coral reef? Uh, Sari, what's a coral reef? (laughs) (laughs) So I'll start with what a coral is. A coral is a type of nidarian. We did a whole episode about them. They are little polyps with tentacles. And there are several different kinds of corals, but the two main groups of them are the stony corals, which excrete calcium carbonate or uh, other forms of it, like calcite, and create rocky structures around them. And then there are another group of corals that are soft corals that just kind of anchor themselves. Sometimes they create a hard skeleton, uh, like like a tube but mostly they branch and they float around and they're more soft. And so coral reefs are specifically created by the stony corals, and they're just when stony corals grow and grow and grow and build upon themselves over thousands or tens of thousands or millions of years and combine with other organisms from fish to mollusks, to crustaceans, to algae, a lot of algae, and they make a whole reef ecosystem. So the etymology of reef specifically is just a ridge underwater, Uh, and it probably Mm, came uh. from Old Norse riff, which meant ridge in the sea or reef in a sail, and it means like a rib, so... If you have this Those bumpy guys are reef. always talking about the ocean, huh? Yeah. And so they're yeah. like, oh, there's this bumpy bit. That's a reef. And then mm-hmm. af- later on, we, we form the compound word coral. I don't think it's compound. Uh, the phrase coral reef. Um, yeah. And the first time that was used was in 1745. So it took oh. a while from us using reef as reef and then associating coral with it. Sure, because we had to figure out what coral was. I guess we probably knew what coral was. <laughs> we kind of did. We were very confused about coral for a very long time. <laughs> I'm still confused about coral. I think of any creature it's on Earth. It's pretty strange. Coral is like the yeah. one that I cannot wrap my head around. I look at pictures of it, and I'm just like, what yeah. are you doing? It's just, well, you got to imagine. Here, I hope I can fix you okay. right now. Great. Uh, the coral that you see, uh-huh. that's not the coral. Right. That's the coral's little house. That's like an anthill that they built. Right. And then they live in it, and then but they build a little house. Do they ever come out? Yeah, if you get real close, you can see them. Oh, okay. They look like you know. Have you ever seen a barnacle like do its tongue? Yeah, out? that's what they are yeah. like. Less yeah, long they're like and more anemones. plentiful. Like yeah, more like an yeah. anemone. Okay. Oh, that did fix me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last I'm problem glad, I had to solve in my life. So no. <laughs> otherwise, I might be a fraud. <laughs> if I can't help Sam understand coral, maybe I, maybe I just need to give up. You are not the only one who is confused about coral, Sam. Humans throughout history have been con- confused about coral. Uh, what what wild shit did Aristotle say? Aristotle, <laughs> yep. Uh, Aristotle, really? his pupil actually. Aristotle didn't uh, have a lot of thoughts about it, I guess, but. Theophrastus, who was Aristotle's pupil, described Mm -hmm. red coral in his book on stones. So he thought it was a rock. But Uh then he also described it in his book on plants. Uh, And so he was like, I can't decide what it is. And so I'm going to sneak it into my book on rock and plant and hope no one notices because (laughs) it's maybe a little bit of both. He was kind. You know, he was going in the right direction. Ish. And then Pliny the Elder, another classic guy. uh, To get stuff wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He he said, well, they're not animals or plants, but they're a third thing. And then he didn't go mm. on to specify what the third thing is. He was just like, eh, it's not an animal or a plant. Not, not so he was also know. wrong because it's an animal. <laughs> it's an animal. <laughs> um, and then more people just kept guessing. Uh, a Babylonian scholar referred to it as a type of tree. They, there was like a lot of, it is a tree, so that went in the plant direction. Yeah. And then a, a Persian polymath named Al-Biruni classified both sponges and corals as animals because they respond to touch. So he was on the right track around cool. 1048. Um, and then 
in the 18th century, we actually had microscopes and could look at corals and then saw the cells and were like, ah, yes, that is in fact an animal. I also, what it seems weird to me is just picturing Theophrastus diving under the water yeah, and holding his breath too. and like trying to get hmm. some air around his eyes to like look at coral while it's still under the water. Yeah. But he probably didn't do any of that. He probably got some guy to bring him some and he was like, that looks like a rock mm-hmm. or a plant. Underwater stroke in his beard. Hmm. Yeah. What could this be? You know, Pliny wasn't always old. At one point, <laughs> he I mean, he was the elder of the, the Pliny's, but like, I'd like to picture him as like a 22-year-old, just just fresh-eyed, bushy-tailed, <laughs> try, thinking of like, what's my legacy going to be? Oh, they're going to make fun of me on podcasts forever. Mm-hmm. Was, I'm just going to say a bunch of stuff. Was the other yeah. Pliny his son or his brother? He was a ne- nephew. Pliny the, nephew. Nephew. Pliny the Younger was the nephew, yeah. and Pliny the Elder was was the uncle who helped raise and educate him. Unky Pliny. <laughs> Unky? No, no, that's kind of cute. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Before we get any more lost, we're going to play our game for the day. Do you guys want to play a Tangents Coral Truth or Fail? Yes. I love it. That's great news. Corals are contending with a lot at this very moment. We've got warming yeah. waters, diseases that have reduced their numbers overall. Scientists have been studying corals to see how we can better protect them from ourselves and the rest of the world, coming up with strategies that might sound strange but could yet prove useful in their protection. The following are three curious coral contraptions designed with their futures in mind, but only one of them is real. Is it? Story number one. Sexual reproduction is tough when you don't move anywhere, and corals rely on a number of signals to align the release of eggs and sperm across different colonies. To spur the birth of more coral... To spur the birth... To spur the birth of more (laughs) coral... To spur the birth of more corals in a way that still preserves this coordination, Whoa. scientists designed a blanket, I know, it wasn't easy, to, with slow-dissolving fibers that also hold chemical cues to stimulate the corals into reproduction. So we've got a... A uh, sex blankie? A, a sex blankie for oh, corals. Okay. <laughs> Could be story number two, though. That one might be a fake. Uh, story number two is that reefs are usually bustling with activity of many animals, but as reefs die, they become less populated. So to see if they could inject some life back into a dying reef, scientists tried to lure fish towards an area by recording the sound of a healthy reef and then playing it on speakers set up around the dead coral. Or, or it could be story number three. While fish can enhance the ecology of coral reefs, there are also fish that like to eat corals, like the butterfly fish, which makes its meals out of coral polyps. So to protect smaller reefs, scientists have set up the aquatic equivalent of scarecrows mounting plastic decoy moray eels along the perimeter (laughs) to scare off the butterfly fish. So what is it? Is it story number one, weaving a coral sex blanket? (laughs) Story number two, staging a healthy coral concert to attract the fish? Or story number three, scaring off predatory fish with fake eels? Why would attracting fish help the coral? Would it? I think just that there was like reef infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, even though the reef isn't like super vibrant and living, it'd still be a good place for fish to come hang out, I guess. Uh, But it might also be that like the fish would bring along polyps on them and those polyps could recolonize or something. Okay. I don't know. Okay. That makes sense. My guess is that it has something to do also with fish poop, like just getting a Mm. bunch of nitrogen in the water. Sure. Once fish start doing that, then algae can grow and then the coral polyps polyps have little friends because they they can't live by themselves they live symbiotically with a little dino flagellate inside them so you need all this Mm -hmm. stuff to even make coral be able to grow and maybe having fish there helps seed all that stuff okay sex blanket sex blanket that one sounds that one sounds pretty feasible to me you yeah. don't think so? It sounds small. How do you get it? Is it a, like a humongo sex blanket or do you just say like these corals need I think that they all the dissolve boost. at the same rate. So you can put more than one sex blanket down. Got it. And they all, and if you do it on the same day, yeah. they'll all trigger the release of the. Okay. 
You're like, I'm going to make this <laughs> this coral horny, and I'm going to make this one yeah. a little bit, a like neighbor coral, a little horny, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to... All right, we're going to pick who the horny corals are going to be. Uh, we've got... We're just, <laughs> what, uh, uh, suggestions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most eligible corals of all. D- Timothy, do you have any corals <laughs> that you want to be particularly sexy today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is Timothy a man or a coral? Timothy's a guy, he's one of the research assistants. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. I get it. Timothy is attracted to the corals. <laughs> okay, oh, no. now we're getting to the bottom of it. <laughs> I see. <laughs> the last one, you can put those plastic owls up all day long, and that's not going to scare any birds away. And a parrotfish. Yeah, but fish are fish. I, fish have been birds around the blocks, you know? Fish have been around longer than we've been here. So the they're going to know a fake fish. The fish have a finely honed uncanny valley since I when bet. would a fish ever run into a fake fish though this is gonna be the when first does a time bird ever run a into fish. a fake bird and they still know fish They're fall still for like... fake worms all the time though so i that's feel like they point. might be kind of dumb that's, that's a good they, point they see that's like oh this thing is that's wiggly like, yeah. yum yum oh, yum oh, you, you don't think a fish could fall for a fake fish i have a i have news about all, all fishing? of the fishing <laughs> <worries>. <laughs> Yeah, okay. but I don't know if it fish would be could never fall of, for yeah. a fake fly. That's just unacceptable. <laughs> fish are geniuses. <laughs> okay, I miscalculated. I guess <laughs> you'd have to clean your fake eels, though. I feel like if they got too overgrown and like then grimy, be grimy, like, then they'd be like. like they're just, what a that's lazy just looking rock. eel. He's yeah. not going to come after me. Mm-hmm. He can't even yeah. clean himself up. How do you keep your your fake eel clean? Uh, <laughs> Timothy I think goes down and scrubs it with a sponge. Tim- yeah. Just, yeah, Timothy's, Timothy's scrubbing. I think you should electrify them like they're electric Mori eels, and then they zap off their algae the every once in a while. Mm. Let's put a 9-volt battery in there. Yeah, that could happen. <laughs> I think I've watched enough cartoons. I know a nine volt battery is not very much, but I've watched enough cartoons that I'm like, that's just going to kill all the fish in the reef. It's going to, and, go, and then yeah. the electricity is going to shoot out. <laughs> and then Aquaman will have to come in and save the day or something like that. And arrest Timothy. Yeah, <laughs> for his crimes against nature. <laughs> mm, I'm feeling sex blanket. I just like the way it sounds. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> Sam's in for sex blanket. I'm going to think, I think it's the choral concerts. I feel like I've heard something about this before. I might have been misled, but I think it's like if you pretend that the coral are there or the fish are there, then others are like, there's a party happening. We'll come. All right. Well, uh, in the case of sex blankets, nothing like that has ever been done or true. Well, um, it could be now, though. <laughs> The only true part of that is that uh, spawning coral reefs do require a lot of synchronization. Stony corals sexually re- reproduce by releasing a bunch of eggs and sperm into the water around them, and it's up to the eggs and sperm to find each other once they're in the water. So figuring out when to release that stuff requires uh, colonies, some of which might be pretty far from each other, to coordinate using various signals around them, like the temperature, the length of day, and the time of sunset. Hmm. So they're being careful, those corals. Mm -hmm. They're paying attention. But when it comes to uh, coral concerts, scientists had previously recorded sounds around the Great Barrier Reef and found that when they played those recordings for juvenile fish, the sounds taken from areas after they had begun degrading were less appealing to the sounds taken before degradation Mm -hmm. when the reef still seemed to be healthy. So they decided to see if they could use the sound of a healthy reef by setting up 33 patches of coral rubble in 2017. They divided divided those patches into three groups of 11 patches each. One group stayed as is, while the other two were surrounded by loudspeakers. And in one of those groups, the loudspeakers played recordings at night taken at a healthy reef. The researchers described the audio as like a loud crackly sound, like frying bacon. And this is the sound of snapping shrimp claws. There's also various grunts and whooping sounds which come from fish in the reef. The third group of speakers uh, had speakers, but no audio playing, just to make sure that it wasn't the speakers that were attracting (laughs) the animals. So the researchers studied the patches for 40 days, and they found that at the end of that time, there were twice as many juvenile fish in the patches with a healthy reef soundscape, and the diversity of the species was also higher. Uh, Now, that does suggest that sounds might be one way to lure fish to a reef and help build up activity there, but the researchers frame this as just one tool of many that will likely need to be combined to help us make reefs happier and healthier. What if it had been the speakers? What would that? What would that imply? <laughs> Gotta just go to the go to go to Radio Shack. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
and just <laughs> sprinkle them just start in the ocean. dumping them in the ocean yeah yeah i mean ele- like amazon's basically giving away alexa that's true so just, just amazon just snap them up back that truck into the ocean <laughs> And as for the fake moray eels, in a 2015 paper, researchers described constructing fake moray eels by printing out two life-sized photos and then gluing them together and laminating them and putting them on strings (laughs) so they could move them like a puppet. Oh, no. And they also constructed a fake coral reef around the eel, and the fake eel reef set up was so that they could study how eels team up with grouper fish to lure out Mm. uh, other fish to eat. I don't know how they did that specifically. But it sounds like fun. With a that's laminated a, life-size cutout. That's the laziest out. way to yeah. make that eel. <laughs> you, could eat, you could make it 3D. You could yeah. put a tube down there, maybe. Or, like, fill a sock. A tube or a sock would be far better. <laughs> yeah. You just paint the sock. So congratulations, Sari, on your point. Okay. That gives you a, a lead as we head in to uh, our short break. And then we'll be back for the Fact Off. Welcome back, everybody. Now it's time for the Fact Off. Our panelists have each brought in science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question for you. So as we talked about in our game, many coral species re- reproduce sexually through a process called broadcast spawning. Mm. <laughs> and those broadcast spawners pack their eggs and sperm together in bundles, and then they uh, gather together on surfaces, increasing the odds that fertilization will happen. Well, in 2016, researchers reported the results of an effort to count the amount of coral egg and sperm released in one of these spawning events using a soft plastic bottle to collect gamete bundles after they are released. The <laughs> and, <laughs> in one coral species, the researchers counted the average an average of 26.67 eggs per bundle. And I'm going to ask you, what was the average number of sperm they counted per bundle? It's got to be more, right? Like I would think human it would be eggs to sperm, any other animal. More. Yeah. How um, many sperms does a human have? I don't know. I don't either. Okay. 20,000. Go oh. <laughs> <laughs> 20,000 oh, sperm per I was going to say 270,000. Oh. Well, the answer is 9,330,000. Oh, <laughs> so. <laughs> 9 ah, million? Lots. And now you know. <laughs> So congratulations, Sam. That means you get to decide who goes first. Thank you. I'm going to go first. Okay. Surely by now, I think we briefly did, in fact, talk about how most coral get a majority of their food via their symbiotic relationship with zooxanthellae. Is that how you say yeah. that word? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. You got it. That's a fun name. I'm going to name my my child zooxanthellae. <laughs> little, they're little single-celled fellows capable of photosynthesis, which also give coral its wild colors. Uh, while coral polyps can, in some cases, eat stuff like detritus and even little fish, corals with zooxanthellae get up to 90% of their food by sharing the fruits of photosynthesis. In 2016, scientists pointed lasers at coral and figured out that coral are even structured pew, pew, pew. to especially yeah, <laughs> scatter light across as much of their surface as possible so that mm. all the colony can mm-hmm. get a little light snack. Uh, and coral will even shift their tissues around to scatter light as effectively as possible as the light changes. And while this research was done on the familiar, fun-colored, shallow water coral that everyone loves, this also mm. applies to the paler, less popular branch of the coral family tree, deep water coral. So these coral live, as the name implies, in deep water. And one problem with deep water is that not too much light gets down there. So deep coral aren't as vivacious as shallow coral, growing either all on their own or in comparatively small colonies and lacking the bright colors. Because what good is photosynthesizing zooxanthellae if there's no light to photosynthesize? But their lack of color is a bit misleading because while some deep coral don't have zooxanthellae, I think, uh, and basically none of them have enough to turn nice colors, some deep coral do have of zuos and theli, uh, they just keep them inside of them, uh, and they have just as many tricks to spread the sunlight as their shallow water cousins do. 
So corals aren't just pretty in ways we can see, they also contain fluorescent pigments that glow under UV light, and deep water corals have these too. Some of this fluorescence is used to lure in food, but scientists have thought for a long time that deep coral fluorescence might be playing a part in photosynthesis. So in 2022, I guess we finally had cameras that were small enough to shove into a coral, because <laughs> that's what scientists did, and they discovered that deep coral... Uh, in this case, chalice coral, have chambers of fluorescent cells that absorb the blue-green wavelengths of light that make their way into the deep ocean and re-emit that light as orange-red light, which is much rarer on the ocean floor, but better at getting like deeper into the coral's tissue. So using this trick, deep sea coral seem to be able to get their zoos and thelly friends about 50% more of that good, good orange light food. And I guess the lesson of this is while shallow water coral get all the attention for their flashy exteriors, deep coral is just as beautiful on the inside. So sometimes these corals don't need zooxanthellae at all, and they can sort of like make their way th th down deep, but sometimes they still do have this mutualism. From what some articles said, deep coral eat stuff and do not photosynthesize. But I think this might be challenging that, but I couldn't mm. quite get like a- Yeah, because that's, that's what I understood as well. Yeah, I think that, yeah. That, that this is making them rethink how they get food instead of being like, no, couldn't possibly. Wikipedia still says that deep coral do not have zooxanthellae, but- Right, well. What do they know? As long, if it got through peer review, it might be time to make an update to the Wikipedia page on deep coral. All right, Sari, what do you got for me? Pistol shrimp, also known as snapping shrimp, are one of the more internet famous residents of coral reefs, and we talked about them in the soundscapes. Uh, they live in nooks and crannies and have one relatively giant snapping claw, which is where they get mm -hmm. their name. They can clamp it shut so powerfully that a cavitation bubble collapses, a huge pop echoes underwater, and they shoot a water jet to stun or kill their prey. It's pretty dang cool, but I would argue that there's something even weirder about the Synalpheus genus of pistol shrimp, their complex social behaviors. A typical colony of Synalpheus regalis shrimp lives within coral reefs inside the hollows of sea sponges. And instead of just one or two shrimp living side by side, there could be hundreds of them crawling around. Somewhere in those masses, you'll find one large female shrimp whose body is full of eggs and whose snapping claw maybe isn't as bulky because she doesn't need to defend herself. She's the the shrimp queen, which oh. sounds just like ants or bees or termites or naked mole rats because it basically is as far as we can tell. The other S. Wow. regalis shrimp have various roles in the colony, from workers who care for the future generations, soldiers that defend the sponge from any predators with their snapping claws, or a male that impregnates the queen. And instead of all fighting each other to pass on their genes, it seems like reproduction in the non-queen females is repressed somehow and everyone gets along just swimmingly. There are about six or seven other species of pistol shrimp in this genus that show the same kinds of social behavior to varying degrees. Some colonies have multiple queens or a battle for the position and more average snapping claw sizes to facilitate that conflict. And almost all of the research, starting with a paper in Nature in June 1996, is led by one marine biologist named J. Emmett Duffy and his colleagues. And the most recent study I could find was published in March 2018, where 353 egg-bearing females from 221 colonies of six different species of shrimp were compared to see how their body plans varied. But we, there's a lot we don't know because studying these shrimp colonies is relatively recent in the last couple decades. And we have so many questions about how their social structures form and get enforced and how the juveniles mm -hmm. grow up because we've been studying bees and ants and stuff a lot longer. And we can only do that as long as coral reefs exist to house them. And so there's so much life in the ocean. Who knows what other weird mysteries are hiding in the nooks and crannies of coral reefs. <laughs> if anybody seems like ants, it's shrimps. That makes total <laughs> sense to me. That, Sam's on board, whereas I'm like, no, unacceptable. That's not how evolution works. <laughs> how do you pick one one matriarch? To, there's other females, I imagine. Mm -hmm. do, do they also get eggs? No, I don't they think don't get so. Eggs at they all. don't get eggs in the colonies. Sometimes, like some some of the social shrimp have like some competitions still but mm. mostly mm -hmm. uh like in this species in s regalis it's one big big honking queen that wow. has all the eggs Why? What? Is, i guess it, do they protect her do they have to keep her safe yeah so the, the the i think the workers 
are a mix of female and male, but the soldiers are mostly male and they've got really mm-hmm. big, strong snapping claws. And so they they stand sentry around her. Uh, and if anything tries to come at the sponge, what the come hell? in the sponge holes, they snap them away. All right. That's real weird. Is she, uh, and there's one, there's one, but sometimes more than one per colony. Mm-hmm. Yes. Hmm. Those little guys got to stick together. This is nice. I like that. But it's weird that they stick together. It's like they didn't. It's not really how it tends to work. No. And somehow they did it evolutionarily. They didn't just decide like, like, oh, let's hunt together. It's like, no, we're yeah. going to live in this sponge together and all care for each other very deeply. <laughs> yeah. Which I guess is how ants work, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I guess that's not that weird it, 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 in as much as ants are very weird. Mm-hmm. Like if that's weird, bees are also weird. Yes. Exactly. I think Which are they are. What's weird and surprising is this is the first ocean creature we've found that does it. Mm-hmm. So everything else has happened well, on land. Pliny the, Pliny the Elder should have taken his little nephew down there yeah. and swam around and figured School that out for us thousands better. of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to, I I have to give it to Sari because I think it's sense. weird and she already came in with one point. Yeah. Um, though the fact that we got a fact so good that we might have to correct Wikipedia is also very good, Sam. And that means that Sari is the winner of the episode, and it also means that it is time to ask the science couch where we've got uh, we got some listener questions for our finely honed couch of scientific minds. At Cammy J Boy asks, do artificial reefs actually help? Yes, they must. Especially if we if have you the, put some boom yeah, boxes down the boom there box and play them pistol shrimp noises. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we actually just did a sci show on this, uh, and I was surprised by one of the ways that uh, artificial constructions can help fish which is that it prevents trawling so like the illegal mm, fishing that right. trawls the bottom if you put enough like heavy stuff down there if it's like jagged it will catch the nets and the the the, the fisher people will not be able to do that thing anymore <laughs> uh, which is why oftentimes you have really big fish around uh sunken shipwrecks because they can't get caught by the big nets because you can't trawl a net over a big shipwreck hmm. Anyway, that's what I got from a SciShow episode that we just did. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's on my list, too. Yeah, reducing trawling, um, like we talked about, giving more space for fish to populate the structures, especially fish that need hidey holes to feel safe reproducing. Um, though there's an asterisk on that. Because to feel safe reproducing. So you're saying like a, like a little, a little sex little dungeon. Lover, lover's nest. Yeah. <laughs> okay, a little sex <laughs> dungeon. <laughs> and I should have let you say it. That was nice. <laughs> lover's nest. Was, um, but there's, there's some research trying to figure out whether that actually increases fish populations over time or if it just causes fish to gather and become more dense from across the ocean. And that's kind of a hard Mm -hmm. thing to study because it is notoriously difficult to estimate populations across the ocean because it's so vast and you can't just like drive a submarine and count. And the other pro is knowing that humans like to look at coral reefs, both for Mm -hmm. research and for pleasure uh, (laughs) to observe the sex dungeons. Artificial reefs can help reduce the pressure on natural reefs. If people just, tourists want to come down, see some fish, you can do that in an artificial reef and it can be less disturbed by that traffic and alleviate some of the pressure on the natural reef. So people leave it alone, it can flourish, and people can still have the vacation of their dreams. One of the cons of it is this idea that we were kind of discussing in our debates with the with the TORF, um, which is that if fish come to an artificial reef, what happens to the coral polyps? Like, will the coral polyps repopulate? And that is a big, long-standing question. For example, one paper studied a, uh, a maybe the oldest artificial reef because it was an accidental artificial reef. And researchers compared that to a nearby natural reef, and the artificial reef had a lot less biodiversity. There was different coral species dominating, d- fewer species overall, and had less uh, interspecies interactions of like corals, anemones, algae, and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, it's it's never going to... Uh, reefs are just so complex and overlapping and changing. And also, I remember 
stories of like, I don't know, this is definitely a thing where in Florida, they just were like, well, if we just dump the tires into the water, <laughs> mm-hmm. then like the, it'll be like a reef. And then they dumped the tires into the water. They did this. They dumped the tires in the water. And then it was like, oh, the animals don't like that because it's a bunch of rubber, yeah. mm-hmm. which has a bunch of like toxic chemicals in it. And that turned to be a bad idea. And probably if your head went from, we have a tire problem <laughs> and we have a reef problem. And I know the solution <laughs> to the reef problem and the tire problem. Tire reefs. That was maybe a little too convenient. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got to watch out for that. Yeah. Don't just throw your garbage in the ocean and be like, it's a reef. It's a reef. <laughs> you can't disguise that. The fish know. <laughs> they can tell when a moray eel is made of That'd laminated plastic. <laughs> yeah. Just like throwing bottles in there. Look, it's a bottle. Oh, it's, it's just a it's rock. A it's basically a, a rock. Yeah. Here you go, <laughs> hermit crab. Here's your new butt shell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Zeri. If you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and get access to our Discord and ask us there. Thank you to Ike on Discord, at Amanda728, and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's real easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents and become a patron. You get access to things like our newsletter. We got bonus episodes that we do. We got all kinds of weird stuff there. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show and tell other people. People will see it and they'll be like, ah, I should watch that show. And finally, (laughs) if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell tell people people about about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our editor is Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Deboki Chakravarty. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Most corals have what's known as a blind gut, where the polyps use one opening to both suck in food and poop out waste. But but the species, Leptoceras fragilis, doesn't just have a mouth butt. It has a bunch of microscopic pores in its digestive system that help filter out food and squish out water from its body. So, in a way, this reef-building coral is covered in secret buttholes. We just have to remember that their poop isn't as bad as ours. Oh, and yeah. they can't taste stuff. I feel like I've, I got to remind myself of that too, right? Because you can't be pooping yeah. and eating at the same mouth and be like a gourmet. No, like, and have like a strong palate. Yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> Ratatouille could not have a mouth and a butt in the same space. <laughs> Ratatouille would never. <laughs> that would be the most tragic Pixar movie of all. Uh-huh. Like a jellyfish <laughs> trying to be jelly tooey. Jell Oh, uh, yeah. It's just like, but the guy is a little... It with his hat on, and he's just constantly being stung. And like, <laughs> <laughs> you can't even taste this, you monster. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> this, this bargain is not worthwhile. <laughs> but the food's delicious. The food is delicious. <laughs>